Today, I'm going to be making the least clickbaity video about a war with Iran. That's right, we're talking about the legal nuances of the war powers resolution, the authorization of military force, and the potential ways Congress is going to tweak those rules to try and regulate the president's ability to attack Iran. Bet some of you are regretting clicking that skip ad button right about now. Hmm, maybe that Wix commercial wasn't so bad. Before I get into the tweaks that Congress is trying to make, let me give you a baseline legal understanding of exactly where we are today. First up, we have the War Powers Resolution. This act was passed at the end of the Vietnam War, a time when people had more faith in the dog that had started talking after the second hit than the United States government. The goal of this bill was simple, to address a problem that was pretty common at the time. It was really hard to start a war, I mean you need congress for that, but it was very easy to put troops somewhere they'd get shot. And what are they going to do, just sit there? If America sends troops to North Korea, we might not declare a war, but I'm guessing someone will. So how did the legislative action, in theory, prevent the next Vietnam? Well, it limited the circumstances by which a president can introduce troops to a hostile environment. You can invade a country with a declaration of war, yep, that's a congress thing, specific statutory authority, you know, like voting to invade Iraq, or a national emergency created by an attack on the United States, its territories or possessions, or its armed forces. This is where you can attack an entity without congress, because you've seen how fast congress works nowadays. Japan would be halfway to Ohio before Pelosi and McGonnell could agree on a war declaration. So that's all well and good, but let's just say you don't have congressional approval and unfortunately nobody's attacked you. Can you still invade a country? Of course. You don't get into as many forever wars as America has by having clear rules. In the absence of a declaration of war, in any case in which United States armed forces are introduced into hostilities or into situations where eminent involvement in hostilities is clearly indicated by these circumstances, the president shall submit a report within 48 hours to the Speaker of the House of Representatives. This strategy can be used as long as Congress hasn't explicitly said no to the war ahead of time. So again, this is probably already seeming like the much easier route. Gee, I could either get congress to agree on something, or I could make an underling write a book report on Yugoslavia. That's foreshadowing. The submission of this report to the House of Representatives triggers the next step in this process. Within 60 calendar days after a report is submitted, the president shall terminate any use of United States armed forces with respect to which such report was submitted, unless Congress has declared war, has enacted a specific authorization for such use of the United States armed forces, has extended by law such 60 day period or is physically unable to meet as a result of an armed attack on the United States. If congress can't agree to extend the deadline and your lawyers can't find any way to justify the troop presence, the president's only option is to immediately end the war, or to appeal to congress for an additional 30 days to get our troops the heck out of there. So that sounds pretty airtight. But unfortunately, this resolution has bigger holes than a bombed out Yugoslavian village. Which brings us to the one time congress actually pushed back on the invasion of a country using this resolution. Enter the least likely wartime president I can imagine. To achieve our aims as an alliance, 19 democratic nations with 780 million people working together in the first sustained military operation in NATO's history. Wait, Bill Clinton's the one with the legally questionable war? Wow, this is like finding out your hippie uncle has a gun collection. So NATO forces, including the United States, began bombing Yugoslavia. Two days into the bombing campaign, Bill Clinton submitted his report to Congress, triggering the 60 day clock. Now this is where we start getting into the dark side of the moral gray area. Upon receipt of the report, congress voted down a declaration of war with Yugoslavia, 427-2, which alright, not much room for interpretation there. 
and then they voted down authorization of airstrikes. Fortunately for Clinton, Congress at this time was doing what they did best, and all bills to end the war or the bombing campaigns also failed in Congress. I guess most legislators were just used to voting no on everything out of a force of habit. Should we be bombing Yugoslavia? Oh, definitely not. It's terrible. So should we stop? Eh, let's not put words in my mouth. Military intervention might be helpful. At this point, with a Congress only agree that option was terrible, we were just running at the clock and waiting for that 60 day waiting period to end, at which point Clinton would either have to get out of Yugoslavia or ask Congress for 30 days to set up a withdrawal. Well, the 60 days passed and nothing happened. 30 representatives called up Clinton, showed him a calendar and said, hey man, you've passed the 60 days, figure it out. Clinton kind of ignored them. At this point, as Congress, what can you do? Well, you bring in the third branch, the judiciary, to hold the executive branch accountable. Congress took the president to court, specifically Representative Tom Campbell, leading to the court case of Campbell v. Clinton. Talk about suing for peace. Now this case wasn't exactly as dramatic as my intro made it sound, because the war didn't last that much longer than 60 days. Their only hope was that the world would not turn away in the face of ethnic cleansing and killing, that the world would take a stand. We did for 78 days. Still, according to my in-depth calculations, 78 is bigger than 60, so something illegal happened. Now, much of this case was heard after the war had come to a natural conclusion, so it kind of lacked some of the Hollywood dramatic pizzazz that you would hope for when you choose a court case to write about. Still, this is the only instance I can find of Congress citing the War Powers Act to sue the president, so I'm working with what I was given here. There were two arguments that were heard by the courts. First, did Congress have standing to sue the president for violating the War Powers Act? Congress argued that the War Powers Act explicitly said if Congress doesn't approve of the war in 60 days, you have to leave, 78 days in and Clinton hadn't acted. The court looked at this and said, Congress, you could have ended or continued that war at any point by simply majority voting no or yes. Just decide if you like this. Why are you bringing this to our court? Now, Because that might sound like a very weird conclusion to draw, I'll quote the decision. It is uncontested that the Congress could terminate the contested program where a sufficient number in each house so inclined because the party's dispute is therefore fully susceptible to political resolution, we would, under circuit precedent, dismiss the complaint to avoid meddling in the internal affairs of the legislative branch. Because of this, it was ruled that Congress lacked legal standing. Now This brings us to Clinton's argument, which is much more alarming in today's context. Sure, we submitted the report, but this wasn't a war. This law says that when you introduce troops into a hostile environment, the 60 days are triggered. We were simply bombing that country from a distance. It's only a war if they fight back. Great. The question posed by the appellants, whether the president's refusal to discontinue American activities in Yugoslavia violates the War Powers Resolution, necessarily depends on the statute having been triggered in the first place. In a very alarming decision, the courts eventually decided a whopping shrug to this question. This certainly looks like a war, Yugoslavians are dying, but there's no legal definition of war and American troops aren't introduced to hostility. We're gonna have to punt and dismiss this case solely on Congress's lack of standing as decided earlier. To go back to the decision, appellants cannot point to any constitutional test for what is war. Even if this court knows all there is to know about the Kosovo conflict, we still do not know what standards to apply to those facts. Well, that's not at all alarming to read after the rise of drone warfare. Obama used a similar argument after he bombed Libya without congressional approval or dissent. 
So Clinton won that case in the Court of Appeals. This brings us to this week. Democrats say there should be no further strikes against Iran without congressional approval. So how are Democrats going to defeat war? Well, Tim Kaine introduced a yet to be named as of the writing of this episode piece of legislation. It uses the War Powers Resolution to stop the United States from attacking Iran. The conflict between the United States and the Islamic Republic of Iran constitutes, within the meaning of the section of the War Powers Resolution, either hostilities or a situation where imminent involvement in hostilities is clearly indicated by these circumstances into which the United States armed forces have been introduced. Hard to argue with that one considering the constant Iranian attacks against our green zone over the past few days. Building on this, he writes, in the most convoluted way of saying you have 30 days to make nice with Iran, Congress hereby directs the president to remove United States armed forces from hostilities against the Islamic Republic of Iran, or any part of its government or military, by not later than the date that is 30 days after the date of the enactment of this joint resolution unless explicitly authorized by a declaration of war or specific authorization for use of military force. Now, unlike with Clinton, if this bill passes, Congress wouldn't be running the clock for those 60 days to pass, but instead taking the initiative to actually end the war. We would then have that 30 day withdrawal period to either remove our troops or, with our track record, make things so bad that it would actually require Congress to approve an intervention. Of course, nothing can ever be that simple. Every time we've talked about the War Powers Resolution so far on this video, there are three situations mentioned. A declaration of war. That hasn't happened. Congress is physically not able to meet. Let's hope that doesn't become an issue. Or finally, Congress enacts a specific authorization for the use of military force. And uh oh, there are currently two very vaguely written authorizations for use of force out there. Well, the White House asserts that the president had the legal authority to take this action, not only as commander in chief, but under the Iraq War Resolution of 2002. Now, the justification for the killing of Soleimani has been a strange one to report on, because since the last time we talked, the administration has thrown every congressional force authorization against the wall to see which ones stick. First, they were trying to use the authorization of military force from September 18th, 2001. Wonder what was on our mind when we were writing that one. It said that any country, group, or individual who had anything to do with 9-11 attacks could be taken down. This bill has been used over the past 18 years to pin 9-11 on more groups than even the most creative conspiracy theorist could come up with. Let's just hope no one realizes it was an inside job or else look out Texas. Unfortunately, the administration's claim that Iran did 9-11 was quickly called out by everybody. If only there was another justification out there. <laughs> Let me just dust this one off for a try. In 2002, Congress authorized the use of military force against Iraq and Saddam Hussein. Fortunately for this administration, this authorization didn't mention Saddam by name, because I don't think he's going to pose much of a threat nowadays. Instead, the bill says, the president is authorized to use the armed forces of the United States as he determines to be necessary and appropriate in order to defend the national security of the United States against the continuing threat posed by Iraq, and enforce all relevant United Nations Security Council resolutions regarding Iraq. I never thought I'd find myself advocating for this, but Congress, be more specific in some of your bills. According to Lawfare, in theory Soleimani and other targets of the January 3rd strike could qualify, due to the Iran-backed Popular Mobilization Force's history of undermining the rule of law in Iraq and engaging in acts of terrorism targeting US personnel from Iraq. Moreover, just as the 2002 AUMF authorizes the use of force in Syria, where doing so furthers its purpose, it might also authorize the use of military force in other neighboring countries, like Iran. So what does any of that mean? 
Well, if Congress wants to ensure that the president doesn't attack Iran under the 2002 authorization for military force against Iraq, they can change the authorization, repeal the authorization, or take the president to court and see whose interpretation of that authorization is correct. It's a bit hard to uninvade a country if you win the court case though, so I wouldn't recommend the third option. If this AUMF interpretation is used as justification, Congress cannot simply sit out the clock and wait for those 60 days to surpass. Because if this administration were to determine that Iran or its affiliates fall within the scope of either AUMF, this would mean that, in the executive's view, Congress has to authorize the use of all necessary and appropriate force against them. This sets no real limits. The Trump administration may choose to pursue a full-fledged military campaign against each, regardless of how long it lasts or how many US troops it places in harm's way. Nor would any such conflict be subject to the War Powers Resolution 60 to 90 day limitations. Man, this is not a fun episode, is it? Sorry about that. Fortunately for those Americans who want peace, Tim Kaine is coming in in the clutch on this one. That same bill we mentioned earlier, mandating the withdrawal of troops from hostilities with Iran, also explicitly says that the 2001 authorization for use of military force against the perpetrators of 9-11 attack and the authorization for use of military force against the Rock Resolution of 2002 do not serve as a specific statutory authorization for war against Iran, and neither authorize any such action. So that's exactly how Congress is currently planning to combat the president's ability to attack Iran. Sorry for the incredibly long episode, but there's a lot of complicated stuff to unpack here. I hope this episode didn't serve as a cheap alternative for Ambien for you guys, and that it was able to actually deepen your understanding of this incredibly odd intersection of politics, law, and warfare. Thank you, and that is definitely all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube, I'd like to thank my patrons here for helping me put out my videos. If you want to support independent nonpartisan news looking into the, well again, I can't really call this story overlooked, maybe just clarifying the over scrutinized and murky realities of the day, join this growing list of great individuals by clicking the link in the description. Remember to subscribe because my new year's resolution is to get a thousand of you and 899 is the current number. I'm so close I can taste it. Ring that bell so that freedom will continue to ring and give me a thumbs up if you like what you saw. Lastly, as always, thank you for watching.